Hey everybody, welcome to a new video here on the Blue Abroad YouTube channel. Today's video is all about Sam Walsh and it's all about the Sam Walsh situation and what it means for us for the rest of the preseason and also for the start of season 2022. Now, I think we're all aware of the news. Unfortunately, Walsh hurt his ankle in a match simulation on Friday. Somebody tackled him and uh, he has suffered the dreaded ankle syndesmosis injury, which is a really fascinating injury because it's plagued so many players and seemingly it's only really come up since, I'm going to say 2017, 18. I've never really heard of syndesmosis before then. I remember Mark Murphy had it when Patrick Dangerfield, funnily enough, Dangerfield again involved, but Patrick Dangerfield landed on his ankle and that kept him out for a significant chunk of the season. Now, we also know that Liam Stocker is currently recovering from the exact same injury. So it's not a good start. And I think the purpose of this video is to look to the solutions and to start a discussion around, well, okay, it's happened. It's not good. It's not ideal. It's pretty shattering if I'm honest. But at the end of the day, such is life. And life, life happens, shit happens. You get punched in the mouth but the quicker you can move on and find a solution and be better for it, the quicker it is. So uh, I'll start with the initial reaction and, and what I think it does for us. Now, I think, you know, you never want your best players, or in this case, Walsh is probably our best player. You never want your best players not available for preseason and any chunk of, of a season. Uh, I think also when you look at our group, new coaching structure, midfield group, in terms of the system we're going to play, you want to have Walshie, Cripps, Chera, Hewitt at the bare minimum there because when I think about you know grand final day, when that comes eventually, you want those best players there who are really going to be able to drive the system. And I think particularly with a new coaching group as well, I think it's important. I think Walsh coming into his fourth season as well, building off what was an exceptional season three, and, and really it's been an exceptional first three seasons, uh, it, it's, it's not good. It's not good. There is a silver lining, of course. It's happened now. It's not a season-ending injury. It might hinder his ability to play his best footy. But when I also read how it happened, and I read that he shook it off and continued to play in the match sim and actually finished the session, said a few things to me. Said, number one, the mental strength of Sam Walsh is right there. And, and I think we've made note of it before about where he seems to go mentally. He seems to be able to really drive himself into a into a space where very few are meant to go. And that I think is what separates the great good players from the great players. I think even Patrick Cripps is another one there. The the, the pain threshold and the tolerance for injury and, and, and just general soreness, because it does happen throughout the course of an AFL season, is really paramount. And then, you know, the the next part is just really, you know, driving the standards. And I think Walsh is definitely someone that since he arrived at the club as an 18 year old has really lifted the standards. And that's based off what we hear from the footy club, all the interviews, all the commentary around him. Now, he's never missed a game. He's going to miss the, at least the first month based on what we were told by the club. I think in my mind, I'm probably thinking it's going to be more of a he won't be back until the bye-ish time. That's that's in my mind what I'm processing because these are really nasty injuries and there's always some sort of a complication. That's just tricky and it is what it is. But like I said before, through such situations and through such adversity, you really have one of two options. You can either sit there and wallow in what could have been and how the season's over and create the doomsday scenario or you can get back to work and get practical. And the reality with this situation is you don't really get an opportunity to give somebody else some time in that midfield while Sam Walsh is healthy. Now, would I prefer to have Sam Walsh healthy? Of course, but it really just puts that blowtorch and that flashlight on whoever it is that's going to be next. And I think by the time Sam Walsh is back in the side, because he is going to you know, get back into this 22 this season, in my mind, I'm hoping, okay, so who, which player or players are going to have elevated themselves in this, you know, next few month block to say, all right, Sam Walsh is back, but we've also added another player who's taken his game to another level. Now, I know at the back end of last year, we liked what we saw from Matt Kennedy, but I, I still think even with Sam Walsh in the midfield mix, we're still probably one, maybe two midfielders short who play at a certain level. I think we're still maturing as a group and 
you know, if you ask me, we need to be a lot better than what we have been, particularly in that midfield group. So I thought I'd have a look at, you know, what we have available and look at some of the players who I would like to see take that next step. Now, when I look at the midfield group, and if I had to pick, I don't know, six or seven midfielders, taking Walsh out of the equation now, I've got Patrick Cripps, I've got Chera, Hewitt, I think maybe Zach Williams might have to pick up some slack here and, and play some more midfield minutes because I know we've got a little bit of coverage in that half back line. But again, this is all speculative and the purpose of this is for me to start the conversation and, and gather your thoughts because a lot of what's happening right now is pretty much unknown. So Cripps, Chera, Hewitt, Zach Williams, I think Kennedy now locks himself into that side. Um, I think Ed Kerno as well. Now, Ed, I know there's a notion of, oh, he's at the end of his career and we need a kid to push him out. But this is why you have someone like Ed Kerno on the list because you know that if you need a month, you know, four to five weeks where you say, Ed, we just need you in there to, you know, play your best footy. Like I know as a supporter what I'm going to get from Ed Kerno. I know that. So I've got those guys in there. And then when I look at who's next, I've got a couple of names. And this was really the case before while she was injured. I think there's probably four or five names who fit into one or two spots as a midfielder. And so I've got, obviously, you know, there's talk of Paddy Dow. I think the next level below that is probably like a Will Setterfield. Jack Martin is another one. I know that he does play a forward mid role, but in this case, when we need someone to pick up the slack or a couple of people, I would look to a guy like Jack Martin. I think Zach Fish is one who clearly would like to play more midfield minutes. And these are opportunities. I think I think Lockie Fogarty is another one who can show good... good um, Good glimpses as a midfielder. He definitely did it at his time in Geelong. But the other one, the, the one for me who I'm really turning to, not to fill the void for Sam Walsh, but there's a guy who I think we would like to give some more midfield minutes to. It's Jack Silvani. And the reason why I say that is because Jack, very much like Ed, has this trait about him, whereby if we say, Jack, we're going to need you to play 25% more midfield minutes than what you normally would, me... I'm confident in what I'm going to get there. Uh, I really am. I think it's also an opportunity to really see what he's about there. We've still got 30 days at the time of filming this video to figure out who it's going to be before round one. But I think Jack brings that ferocity that we want from players. I think everywhere he seems to play on the field, he brings with him a layer of pressure and intensity and it, it's very infectious. And I think, I think I'd like to see Jack Silvani make the most of this opportunity. Ultimately, I don't know. None of us do. None of us know what the thinking is going on on the inside. But I look at, you know, at the top end, I'm looking at Zach Williams to help us out there because he's definitely capable and that's what he was recruited for to come to the footy club. And I expect a bit more than what we got from him in season 2021. I think he's got the pace. I think he's got the contested side of the game when he's, when he's fully fit. It really just is about him being at his physical and mental best. But yeah, it's, it's Jack Silvani and then one of Fisher, Dow, Setterfield, Jack Martin. I think if we can get one of those four names that I just mentioned there, if you want to include Jack, two of those five names that I've just mentioned there, to take that step, mature, and lock in a spot, this is it. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing better than getting an opportunity presented to you and taking it. So things ramp up another level. I think... You know, if you have, if we had have had this situation happen even earlier, I would have probably had Liam Stocker in that mix. Is it too early to be talking about a Jack Carroll? I'm not sure. Maybe I don't want to put that much pressure on him at this stage, but you know, we do know that he is looking solid. Brody Kemp's another one, but I do believe he's going to be more of a defender as a focus for season 2021. So we spoke about it on the Blue Abroad show. Paul Sebastiani mentioned it's not going to be about a player or or what not replacing Walsh, because that's just not happening. He's he's irreplaceable. You're not going to get the same output from a particular player, but it's going to be a big test of this coaching group that we have, the system that we have in place. And then it, I, I really do believe it's going to be about who's that next man up. And these are what this is what the good clubs do. The good clubs find a way to build a system whereby one man in, one man out. Now, there are certain players that that's very hard to do, but Richmond seemed to do it with Alex Rance a few years back. Uh, West Coast did it a few years ago as well with Nick Natanui. So it's not an impossible task. It really just is about who is going to take that next step. And I can sense the angst because to be honest with you, I don't trust any of those five names that I've given to do it 
consistently and, and good enough for us to beat Richmond or to beat the doggies just yet. But the reality is it hasn't happened. And because it hasn't happened, there is this opportunity. And I just hope more than what I'm confident, I just hope that a couple of them can really take their game to the next level, get some more opportunities at training to you know stake their claim for more midfield minutes. And this is it. This is really it. And like I said, when Walsh comes back, if two of these guys have elevated themselves to a level where they have to play, it's only going to be better for us. So am I upset? Of course, but I need, we need to move on. We need to figure out a solution. So I want to turn the conversation more to you now and, and how your reaction was. I think we all know what the reaction was. It's frustration and, and whatnot. It's got nothing to do with the playing surface, nothing to do with Andrew Russell. It just, it's a football injury. They're tackling each other. They're going in hard. It happens. But I want to see what you think as to how you would provide a solution. Is it a structural thing? Are there certain players you're looking at to really fill that void? And if so, who are they? Let me know in the comments below and we'll chat about it there.